Hi, everyone. Good morning. We have another amazing keynote today, I think. So today we have Marty Smets. He is an ergonomics technical expert from Ford Motor Company. He works quite closely with the United Auto Workers, or UAW. And I think a, a, a great passion of Marty's is also coordinating research studies with universities to advance ergonomics knowledge, the ergonomics literature, and enhance well-being for workers at Ford, and I think very well beyond Ford. So with that, I'd like to welcome my friend and colleague, Marty Smuts. Well, thank you, Marisol. I love seeing you, and I love talking about our shared passion for ergonomics projects. So I appreciate the warm introduction. And good morning, and welcome, everybody. I hope you've all been enjoying the Applied Ergonomics Conference this year as much as I have. I've attended some really great sessions, some really interesting master track discussions. And uh, it's just so nice to connect with colleagues that I haven't seen in person for so long. My, pro my presentation today is called World Class Ergonomics by Design. And you can see I've emboldened the D, the E, and the I. And that's because, as many of you may know, the theme of this year's ergonomics conference is diversity, equity, and inclusion. So my premise today is just like the world-class ergonomics program at Ford Motor, Ford Motor Company is baked inherently into the design and engineering process of all our new parts and processes for our trucks, I'm going to talk about how threads of diversity, equity, and inclusion are inherently woven into the tapestry of ergonomics. So with no further ado, as we like to say in automotive, let's pop the hood. So before we get into it, I'd like to set the scale for US manufacturing in general for automotive. In fact, automotive manufacturing is the largest manufacturing sector in the US. It employs more than 9.5 million people and drives more than $1 trillion into the economy each year. Now that includes over $220 billion in local and state tax revenue as a result of the manufacturing the sales and the maintenance of these vehicles. I'm happy to say Ford Motor Company has been playing in that space for quite a while. In fact, in 2024, we're celebrating our 120th anniversary in this business. Yeah. I know we're credited with inventing the manufacturing assembly line. There's been a lot of other people that have made that even better over the years. We recognize that there's so much opportunity in the future as we expand into electric vehicle products and other hybrids to really accelerate knowledge and technology. And I think in our, as ergonomists and practitioners, we have a lot of work ahead of us to make sure that's done correctly and safely because of the scale that we do it at. I'm also happy to say that Ford Motor Company employs more hourly UAW representatives than any of our automaker friends in North America. And we manufacture more vehicles in this country than any of our friends as well. Sorry, buddies. It's true, though. I love you guys. So that includes more than 57,000 UAW automotive representatives and over 86,000 engineering and administrative staff in this country. So we understand the business. We understand the big job ahead of us. And uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about how that process folds out. But before we do, I'd like to zoom in a little bit more locally and talk about Louisville, Kentucky. I think, you know, Kentucky, I've probably visited this state more than any other state in the entire country. In fact, internally, we call it Kentucky. <laughs> we drove by a lot of blue ovals on the way down, and there's two facilities right here in town. Just up the street, we've got the Ford uh, Kentucky truck plant. In fact, we spent all day there Monday cruising the assembly line, talking about ergonomic innovations. It's one of our world-class facilities. In fact, we're holding our UAW Ford Ergonomics Conference concurrently this week, and we have a number of team members down uh, to participate in those dis discussions and reinforce our ergonomic planning for this year. Of course, at the Kentucky Truck Plant, they've been in business since 1969, and they make some of our most iconic nameplates, like the Ford Expedition. My car was humming with excitement as I was sort of bringing it back to its place of birth last week as I was driving down here. The Lincoln Navigator and the largest Ford F-Series pickup, the Super Duty. Across town, we've got Louisville Assembly, where we make some of our most iconic mid-size SUVs like the Ford Escape and the Lincoln Corsair. Between these two facilities, we employ more than 12,000 UAW representatives, not including all the support staff like engineering and administrative. And I was thinking, geez, that's a lot of people. I wonder how big Louisville is. So I looked up some of the demographic information, and in fact, that's about 5% of the population of Louisville. So as I was walking around town this week, I was looking around, and a little more than 1 in 20 people work at one of those two sites. So this is a big town for us, and I'm really happy to be able to talk to you about ergonomics here in Louisville. 
Briefly, a little bit about my history, just so you understand you know, where I work in Ford and what my career path's been. I really like industrial field-based research. It started in grad school when I was working in the mining sector, and I had the opportunity to go down to a few dozen mines in northern Ontario and instrument large earth-moving equipment and measure vibration and other ergonomics risk factors for the operators that use that equipment. And after that, I went down to McMaster, and I studied under my good friend Jim Potvin, Dr. Potvin over here in the middle. Nice to see you, my friend. Jim got me involved in some upper extremity uh, research and really met, you know, introduced me to the team at Ford. And actually sitting at his table right there is Allison, who hired me to do a research project for Ford Motor Company back in 2008, which ultimately ended up in a job opportunity for me. So from 2011 to 2016, under Allison, I ran the Ford Ergonomics Lab, which is at the time a motion capture facility. So I spent a lot of time putting little silver markers on people and digitizing their kinematics as we plan for future assembly tasks in our, work, in, our, in our workstations and plants. I just want to call out my two good friends and colleagues in the second photo from the left there, Julie Brazier and Patty Racco, who were honored yesterday as ergonomics practitioners of the, the, the year award. I couldn't, honestly, they're great people and great ergonomists and we're just so proud of you. So, great job. <laughs> Sorry to embarrass you, I couldn't resist. In 2017, I was promoted to technical specialist and brought into the Advanced Manufacturing Organization, which was put together to really accelerate our use of technologies innovation in our new greenfield sites where we build batteries and EVs. I desperately missed my ergonomics community, despite being involved in a lot of really interesting technology projects. And last year, I had the opportunity to move back into pure ergonomics role as a corporate ergonomist, which I share with my job share partner, Salim Alada. And we're responsible for in-plant ergonomics, not only in North America, but in all of our global facilities. So enough about my history. I'd like to introduce the real heroes here. This is our UAW Ford North American team. As you can see, it's a really diverse team. They, recognize, they, they come from all of our North American assembly for powertrain, vehicle, body and stamping, and our parts and distribution centers. This was last year at our internal Ford Ergonomics Conference. We also have a wider team in Europe and South America and India, of course. Um, in fact, many of my friends here are here today. I'd like to ask all my Ford UAW buddies just to stand up and say hello for a moment. We love this conference. Please, guys, take a stand. And so for those of you not standing, I encourage you to take a look around at the people that are standing and make a mental note to go say hello. Hey guys, nice to see you all. <laughs> they would love to talk to you about our in-plant process. But of course, the theme for today is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And when the conference organizers asked me to speak on this subject, at first I thought, geez, DEI and ergo, that's gonna be a tough one. And then the more I thought about it, I was like, wait a second, like literally everything we do is tied into diversity, equity, and inclusion. But before we get into it, I'd like to define what those things mean so we're all sort of coming from the same playing field. So diversity represents the sense of variety in your workplace or your team, okay? So if you think of yourself at the center of a diversity wheel, it makes up the things that make us unique from one another, like our cognitive, so you know, our IQ, our physical characteristics, so in ergo that might mean strength, posture, or sorry, <laughs> posture frequency, strength, stature, mass, our values, what is our moral structure, our societal, so where are we from, where have we been? Occupational characteristics, like what do we do and what's our tenure in that occupation? And even our relational. Are you married, do you have children, are you a grandparent? All these things and all of our pool experiences make us different people. And that diversity is important to embrace. In fact, there's lots of evidence to suggest that diverse teams come to faster, more creative solutions. Equality and equity. Now, the E stands for equity, but I think it's important to put it next to equality because those two terms are often misunderstood, and in fact, people think they're doing good by going after equality, when in fact, equality acts to drive further voids between us sometimes. This is a classic graphic that you know, compares the two. And the definition I like the most is that equality is equality of opportunity. So in the graphic on the left, you have three individuals who are given the same opportunity to peek over the fence and watch the balloon race. They have the same size box. But because of the inherent diversity between those three people, they don't have a quality of outcome. Their points of view are very different. That is an inequitable experience for them. To really provide equity, you need to understand the diversity between us and specialize the treatment for each person 
so that the outcome is the same. So you have equality of outcome, which the graphic on the right shows. Tall person may not need a box. The shorter statured person may need two. I'm severely myopic. Equality would be giving everyone in this room my glasses, but I promise you that would be an unpleasant experience for like 98% of you. You'd probably be spilling your coffee and bumping into things. Equity would be providing you with each your prescription so you all have 20-20 vision, okay? Inclusion is also very important. You know, Dr. Choswood made some really cool statistics. He presented some cool statistics later, yeah, yesterday. He said, so first, inclusion is the sense of belonging or integration in your team and building a culture that supports that. Dr. Choswood said that, you know, your immediate manager, my manager's right here, Jason, you have a bigger impact on my well-being than my medical doctor. That's an incredible thing. So building an integrated workforce that, makes, that drives inclusion and wellness and a sense of belonging is critical. It also drives more productivity. People perform 30% better when they feel included. Now let's talk about how threads of DEI are woven into the entire business that we do in ergonomics. And I'm gonna talk about three areas in my presentation today. First, I'll talk about diversity in diverse populations, specifically within our UAW operator population. We recognized early on that it's actually a very diverse population and unique from civilian populations. And I'll talk to you about how we manage that to optimize our upfront planning process. I also want to talk to you about the innate inequity in the business that we do in terms of risk distribution to the people we design for. That'll involve some discussion around what our proactive design and engineering processes is like at Ford Motor Company and how we mitigate those inequalities by using advanced manufacturing technology and other new exciting innovations that are coming to the light in the past decade that will support practitioners like us. The last topic is on inclusion, and I want to highlight some really incredible work done by our teams in Mexico to build inclusive workforces by hiring persons with disabilities directly to the line. So, getting into it, I'd like to begin by discussing how we manage diversity in unique design populations. Before I do that, I think it's important to talk about the kinds of problems that we see on the assembly line during vehicle assembly. I think they can grossly be binned into three categories. Hand clearance, force, and extended reach concerns. If you drive a modern vehicle, you know that it's jammed with all kinds of technology. When we look to our customers for things gone wrong and things they don't like, most of it's like, my Bluetooth doesn't work, my infotainment system doesn't stream audible right away, or whatever the issue is. It's so much technology connectivity based. It's, not, it's no longer just about going from A to B. So to you know, package all those modules and all that technology behind our trim panels and in our engine compartment requires a lot of very careful, careful planning. And certainly we use computer models to puzzle them all in to, to, you know, behind those panels real nice and snug, but it makes it difficult to assemble them. As an operator puts his or her hand into that space to grab the part, they're competing with all these other modules and components in that real estate. Force is another big one. So as we snap trim parts on the body or as we made an electrical connector or wiggle a hose onto an exhaust or onto a you know, rad hose onto a port or something like that, those forces also need to be controlled. And also extended reach, reaching across a large battery pack or to the midline of a vehicle to you know, route a center console or something. These are all issues that we tend to see. So rather than wait till we hang, part, or hang tools or cut parts or build workstations, we now look at all of this stuff up front. And we use it, we do that using digital human models that represent our operator population and digital parts that we, we can slow build virtually to assemble the car. So every new part and every new process is evaluated using this method. So for hand clearance, we use a mannequin that has really large hands. And if the large hands fit in the space, we assume that smaller hands will also fit in that space and everyone else should be able to reach the part. For force, we accommodate the weakest members of our population with the assumption that, hey, if the weakest people can have generated enough force to snap it into place, the stronger ones will too. And not just once a day, but at whatever frequency we think we might be building that car, once a minute, right? And in fact, those estimates of force and the acceptable forces we give to each part based on the unique postures people need to get into to perform that task, we whisper that into the ear of the design engineer for that part. So this person who makes the grill in the, piddle, in the picture in the middle, not only will they have to you know, meet all other kinds of quality specifications and push pin count and wiring constraints and all the other things they do when they design a part, 
they know they have to meet a specific insertion effort target provided to them by the ergonomics engineer. Extended reach is also a big one, and we use shorter mannequins to make sure that we have the reach acceptability to all the processes. So certainly we make a lot of expensive decisions using digital human models. Not only do we posture them around the vehicle, as I've just explained, but we use those same mannequins to create acceptable work zone guidelines. So tooling engineers, those that create our racks and build our platforms and build up the workstations, they have guidance as to, well, how high should I present this part to the person or how, sure, how far should I make them reach? So how do we choose the dimensions of that mannequin? Certainly we can lean into all sorts of publicly available anthropometry databases, so the measures of size and body dimension. And there's lots available, Answer, Caesars, NHANES, it's lots out there. But what we recognized early is that our UAW population is unique and diverse. In fact, they're diverse on a number of factors. First, with ethnicity. We have a very high representation of African Americans in our UAW population. Even more so for females, almost three times as many as the civilian population. We're also underrepresented in terms of Hispanics. For all other ethnicities combined, we're a little bit all over the map, a little higher than civilians for males, a little lower from females. And we also happen to be different on more physical dimensions like stature and mass. So the histogram on the left is stature. You can see some yellow bars popping out in the middle and on the right. That tells us we tend to have a greater number of average height people and taller people in our population when compared to civilians. We also tend to be a bit heavier, probably because we're taller guys, don't worry. You know, you see the yellow bars popping out in the middle and trailing towards the right? That means we have heavier bodies as well, which means our limb segments are heavier. So if I reach forward to grab something, my arm and my upper arm, my forearm and my upper arm will be heavier and cause more strain on my shoulder, and, and we should account for that during the upfront planning process. So as a result, we created our own suite of, well, we created our own UAW anthropometry distribution. We did this with Dr. Matt Parkinson at Penn State who's considered a world expert on anthropometry and the creation of synthetic anthropometry distributions. And from that database, we generate our own set of UAW Ford mannequins. So to summarize this section, as practitioners, we need to recognize the innate diversity in our design population. And diversity is just a fact, right? So you have to look at your population, recognize if it's diverse and unique. And at Ford, we responded by creating our own suite of mannequins to optimize the design of the work for, those, for the population who will be performing that work. All right, the second section is the challenges in delivering equitable, proactive ergonomics. What I mean by, the, what I mean by this is that a neat part, the neat constraint of ergonomics is that we unfortunately provide inequitable risk for the people we design for. I've gotta assign some mass to the toad. I've gotta draw the line in the sand somewhere and say the force to put that part on has gotta be 15 pounds but we might have different people performing that work. I might have a stronger person or a weaker person who are working at different capacities as a result of that. They may be taller or shorter, so they need to adopt different postures to do it. It's just part of what we do, but we can mitigate that. I'll give you a couple very simple examples. We provide our design, you know, our workstation design guidelines based on the stature of our mannequins to our layout engineers. Maybe a layout engineer is designing some work to be done. Maybe they're putting door cladding on the side of the truck. So they say, well, I'm going to put my mannequin in that space, and I'm going to need a 20-inch platform to put that workspace in the perfect zone. OK, I've done the best I could. I've built some monuments in my plant. I got a platform, or I've dug a pit, whatever I need to do. But then we actually launch the product, and we hire an A crew, and a B crew, and a C crew, and they all show up for work. And it turns out that, hey, we have a lot of diversity in our population. We got tall people. We have short people. We have average height people they're all gonna be performing this work based on their own innate qualities. Very basic example, but here, now their hands are all in different locations and they're all gonna be adopting different postures. They're gonna to have to change their joint angles, which changes the, you know, the length of the muscles that articulate those joints, which changes those muscles' ability to generate force. Now we're all working at different capacities. And of course, we design for populations, so we assume everyone will still be safe, but it's innate, innately inequitable. I'll give you a slightly more interesting example with respect to automotive. In certain workstations, vehicles travel above the operators and they perform work on the underside. This could be, I don't know, 
brake lines or fastening aero shielding in to improve the aerodynamics and fuel efficiency of our trucks. But this is an interesting little problem because when we set that line height, it's gotta be low enough so that the shortest people in the population can still reach the part they need to work on. But it also has to be high enough that the tallest people in the population you know, don't bonk their heads or have to obtain a stoop posture to perform that work. So in this very simple example, I have a short and a tall statured operator performing work at 74 inches overhead, and as a result, adopting very different arm flexion, shoulder flexion angles. The taller person, very mild flexion. Shoulder, the shorter statured person needs to adopt a much more severe amount of shoulder flexion. And if I make a few basic assumptions about the tool weight and the duration they're holding it and the number of secures per minute, I can calculate that the recovery time required by the shorter statured person is much higher. In fact, in this example, it's 12% higher than the taller statured person just because of their size and strength capability. By the way, they're smaller and weaker and still supporting a tool of the same weight, okay? So what can we do to make those differences a little more equitable? And certainly there's lots of technologies that allow us to do this. Like I said, we were at Kentucky Truck Plant on Monday, walking the line. It's one of our best in class facilities. And Jimmy Ford, who runs the local ergonomics committee out there, was showing us all kinds of great innovations. They have platforms within workstations. The entire length of the workstation, the operator can walk in and press a button, raise themselves up, really optimize that working height based on their own stature. Next shift can come in and again, tweak it to their own needs. But in a modern day assembly plant, things are done differently. We tend to move towards uh, less permanent features like platforms and pits, and we're leaning more on hybrid conveyance systems that involve AGVs. So let's take a look at how modern assembly line technology can help us in this regard. Uh, welcome to Rouge uh, Electric Vehicle Center in downtown Dearborn. This is where we make the brand new F-150 Lightning, which is our first fully electric pickup truck. This was a greenfield site. We built it from the ground up. And as you do a quick fly through down final assembly here, you see there aren't really any platforms or pits. These are, things are built differently now. Vehicle chassis ride on their own AGV, their own autonomous little buggy. They sit on a height adjustable skillet. And when the AGV enters the workstation, it stops for about four or five minutes, whatever we do. The height adjustable skillet, which can be adjusted by the manufacturing team to optimize the height, optimize the, the height at which work is presented to the workers that actually are on that station. Let's watch that again. So it enters the station. We can tweak that height to accommodate the specific operators that are in that station. And if we had sh shorter statured people, they will kick out what you see here, the operator in pink. She pulls out a portable platform, which we can, she can stand on, bring the work into a more comfortable zone. So there's lots of very basic ways we can make that risk more equitable using modern assembly line technology. However, there's lots of other innovations that are coming at us these days. As ergonomists, we're being inundated with all kinds of really exciting technologies that aim to help us on the back end. The fact of the matter is we are really excited about these. Even with a really strong, proactive upfront process, we still will have innate inequity in the risk amongst our operators, and we still have injuries. So how can we lean into those technologies to really get value? Let's go back to that example where the operator was under the workstation and look at how things like portable platforms and um, other manufacturing assists can make that experience a little bit more equitable. Here we now have a posture that is a little more similar to her taller counterpart, and the required rest allowances goes down to a much more reasonable level. It's not perfect, but we need to be aware of that inequity and manage it on the back end using technology. So, on the theme of technology, I'd like to speak about some of the research and innovation we've been involved with when it comes to, well, we do have a great upfront process, but we still have a lot of injuries, quite frankly. We have a lot of repetitive work, and people will get injured. So what can we do? Well, we started by looking at the data. And for us, it's shoulders. Shoulders still get injured more than any other body part, and they're also the most expensive body part when it comes to OSHA claims and liability and indemnity claims. Indemnity claims. So we looked to arm support exoskeletons. When they first started hitting the market in 2016, we thought, hey, like, what if we could complement on the back end using some type of assist device that would provide me with lift assist to my arm segment when I performed overhead work, potentially reduce the cumulative demand on my shoulder, and maybe we could make a dent on some of those shoulder injuries. But how well do they work, and how well they will they be accepted? 
So we worked with Virginia Tech and Dr. Maury Nussbaum to look at what I think is the longest, as far as to my knowledge, the longest field study done on arm support exoskeletons to date. We deployed about 80 units to eight plants, and we had about 40 control participants. So these are operators that also performed overhead work, but were not given an exoskeleton. And over 18 months, we surveyed them at different intervals to ask them about you know, their body discomfort. Um, for those that had the device, we monitored how often they use it and what their preferences were and their thoughts were about the device. And for both groups, we also monitored the number of times they visited medical. And we found some pretty interesting things. Most, ex most exciting to us initially was, wow, if they were given an exoskeleton, regardless of how much they used it, they were 52% less likely to go to medical. It's pretty wonderful. But when we asked them how they felt about it, it was a bit of a mixed bag. Certainly, to our surprise, well, or maybe not to our surprise, the majority actually felt quite positive about their device. 82% of people said they felt favorable towards exoskeletons. However, only 60% said they would continue using them. So we tried to dig into why this was. Because we measured utilization rates, and we also asked them about you know, a number of factors about how they felt about their devices, we were able to model factors that significantly predicted use intention. And the two factors that were significant were improved comfort, or I should say the presence of discomfort, since that's really what we're measuring. We're not very good at rating our comfort, but we can sure comment on how uncomfortable we are. And also our perception of improved in performance. So certainly, fit and comfort are going to drive the performance. Presumably how well it fits you will have an effect on how well it works for you. And we already know we have diverse populations, and so what we learned was that the user experience is not equitable for everyone we give a device to. What we really wanted to do was understand if this is something we could plan for up front. We do cost studies three years in advance, so we know exactly what's being hung in that workstation and account for it in the budget. So we can't say, like, I got 30 workstations at this new plant in Tennessee, so I'm going to buy 30 XOs and I'm going to have them in station, because we know that the user experience will be different for each person. So that was a good finding for us. Certainly, they work really well in unique applications, and we've got operators who refuse to let them go. But it depends on the person, and it depends on the job. I sat through a great talk with my friend Ryan Porto and Dr. Nussbaum, who were doing some research on soft exoskeletons at GM. And they've got some really exciting findings where after almost two years, a little more than half of them are still choosing to use the device, which, believe it or not, is a pretty good number. So potentially soft exoskeletons are a step in the right direction. We toured University of Michigan last year, and I talked to some professors who were studying you know, torque preference and timing on an uh, exoskeleton that actuated the ankle. This was a powered exoskeleton. And their participants were treadmill walking, and they had a touchpad in front of them where they control the amount of torque assistance and the timing of torque assistance relative to toe off. And guess what? When you scatter plot that, it's a mess. It's different between each person. So the current generation of devices, which are, you know, they're not smart. They're passive devices that provide assist based on springs and elastics and based on your joint angle or how far up above your head your arm is. They can't recognize what we're doing and they can't recognize how use we are to the device. Potentially, the next generation of products will be able to do those things and provide us with more customized torque assistance, be more comfortable, and also maybe adapt with us as we get to you know, learn how the device works. Now, we might be a little ways off talking to some of the designers and you know, vendors in this space, but this is a lofty goal. And it's something that, as enterprise users who would really like to complement healthy existing ergonomics programs with these types of innovations, we can provide that feedback to the vendors and work in harmony to create something that will really help us. Another interesting topic that's come up a lot lately are wearable sensors. And I'll also include computer vision-based monitoring, posture monitoring in this as well. As an enterprise, what I really want to be able to do is get a leading indicator on risk. This is really important for us right now. We want to monitor things that are happening in the line and fix those problems before they happen or before they leave the workstation. In our controls world, we call this zero faults forward. We detect the problem in the station, we fix it in the station, and then we release the vehicle so that it can be put on a truck and go to a dealership instead of sit in a yard with 3,000 other trucks and have someone fix them after the fact. Ergonomics has that opportunity now as well. Whether it's with a wearable sensor on your hip or your neck or your wrists or wherever, or through a computer vision system that monitors your trunk position over time. We can get this quasi real-time view of trunk position and 
maybe get some types of analog of risk and say, well, you know, as our IEs go through the line and redistribute work after we launch it, maybe we're developing hotspots that we can't see. So I really believe that these technologies in the future could add value to us. But on a very introductory level, we thought, well, how well do these systems do what they say they do on a very basic level? Because part of the problem of commercializing ergonomics is that no vendor wants to tell you what their secret sauce is. Oh, here's my risk score. How'd you get that? Oh, that's our, that's our IP. We can't tell you. OK, so I'm a 72. Well, I've got my own ergonomic risk score, and I've launched a green job, and now I have this disparity, and I don't know how that, where that difference comes from. Or maybe it's giving me haptic feedback as I perform my job. Well, if I'm tied to the line and I'm lifting a part up and every time I lift it, it buzzes at me, it's going to give me anxiety. I can't stop. I've got 600 other vehicles to build today. However, I think on a whole level, if we could monitor risk across an assembly line and get ahead of these injuries, there could be value. So we brought three commercially available systems into a lab, um, you know, instrumented an operator, had them perform different levels of part handling, measured what they were actually doing using the gold truth, so optical motion capture, and then compared it to what the system said the person was doing. And on this chart on the right, it's the amount of time spent in different bins of forward leaning. So 0 to 20 would be like an upright, neutral posture. 20 to 60 would be sort of modest forward leaning. And then we have a more severe forward leaning of over 60 degrees. So the actual is the line in blue, or for my colorblind friends, it's the one that looks more like a hockey stick. I apologize. You can see that system one in green looks pretty close. In fact, all three systems did a good job for severe forward leaning. But system two looked a little different. It was a predicted about 20 seconds less of upright neutral posture and about 20 seconds more of moderate leaning. So they don't all provide the same outcome. There's an inequi inequity in how well they work. And as practitioners, we don't have line of sight to that. I did say we looked at three systems, and there's only two on this chart. I want to show you uh, some findings from that third system real quick. This is just one motion. The, the graph on the left comes from the optical motion capture system, and this is trunk bend, uh, lateral, sorry, lateral bend, trunk flexion, and twist. And, this, and the graph on the right, chart on the right, comes from the other system. And if they were doing the same thing, if they were monitoring what they say they were monitoring, they'd look somewhat similar. I'd be OK even if the shapes were somewhat similar. But there was really no correlation at all. So I think these technologies have a lot of promise. Okay? We're highlighting some growth pains. We're, we're sort of like settling into the trough of disillusionment with these things. But I think as an enterprise, it's important to say, hey, I really believe that this technology can complement a strong ergonomics program. It can give us views on leading indicators that we never had before. I'm OK with this. I'm OK with talking about these things and providing that feedback, because what we want to do is improve the system as a whole. We had a great discussion in the master track, um, what was it, Tuesday afternoon on this topic, uh, Tuesday morning on this topic. It's really exciting what people are doing with computer vision. And I think that there's a lot of hope here. But as practitioners who are curious exploring these tools, make sure you know exactly what you want to answer. Do you want to have a sniffer to, for safety to see what your air quality is like? Or, measure air ambient temperature you know, for other reasons, or are you trying to monitor trunk posture for ergonomic risk? Make sure you know what the tool does and make sure you understand you work with your vendors to get honest dialogue about how well it works. And I've talked to a number, and they're incredibly transparent. They will tell you where their software works well, and they'll even say, don't say I said this, but this other vendor who's a competitor of mine, they have a top-notch product. I was really impressed by some of the conversations I've had this week. Moving on, this is my final portion of the talk. It's inclusivity on the assembly line. And I want to highlight some excellent work done by our teams in Mexico who really took their DEI corporate training to the next level. They created a diversity, equity, and inclusion task force. And this shares some of the great work done by the inclusion team in hiring persons with disabilities directly, on, directly into their workforce. They did this in concert with a whole tear up of some of their facilities that happened with a new vehicle launch. And what they did was they said, wow, you know, what if we could bring in a lot of people from our community who have disabilities and put them right on the line? So they hired some consultants, so people in their local communities with disabilities. They had some people in wheelchairs, some people with unilateral amputees, some people with stroke, uh, you know, stroke patients that had mobility difficulties on part of their body, hearing, vision. 
and they walked them through the facility to identify opportunities. The team was cross-functional, and they did safety and facility and cost and timing estimates to see what those, you know, meeting the requirements of this population would mean. They worked with industrial engineering and said, well, we can't do a traditional MODAP study. They're going to require more time. There was a lot of involvement to make this project work. They ran pilot tests. They finalized the design. They made the modifications. And they went on to hire. I'm just going to highlight some of the things that they've done. Well, the video on the left here shows some of the changes they made to their commons areas. This is a restroom facility that they modified to meet the requirements of some of their new team members. They also had to make modifications to some of their PPE. An operator who had mobility deficits on one half of his body couldn't use his hand to pull the glove, the safety glove, on his other hand. So they came up with some clever engineering solutions. And they put one of the gloves in almost like a scabbard where the operator can walk in and you know, sheath his hand into the glove and have it you know, don that PPE with one hand. Clearly, these were well thought out, effortful solutions. Here's a couple of the workstations. We have one operator in a wheelchair. This workstation had to be modified to make it wider to accommodate the turn radius of this individual. They actually created a subassembly buildup station that they mounted to the front of his wheelchair so he could you know, reach over and grab a part from the bin and do a subassembly buildup and then place it in a fixture. The operator on the right here had uh, a stroke and so had some partial mobility issues on half of his body. So they had to modify the footprint of that workstation so that he didn't have to walk as far and so that all the parts he had to interact with were acceptable to manipulate with just one hand. Think of all of the other changes for my manufacturing friends that would have to come in concert with these types of modifications, right? Timing for route delivery, uh, line speed, transfer speed, all the things that you know, each individual now has unique timing requirements. They went to a lot of effort and work to make this happen. Here's what the results looked like. Between Hermosillo, Coatalan, Irapuato, and Chihuahua, they hired 75 positions that were filled by persons with disabilities, with hearing, vision, speech, and mobility, which is fantastic, quite frankly. And certainly, you check the DEI you know, overachiever box. They put task force together and made all this happen. But when I was talking to the team that executed this, I was most curious about, I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. You checked the box. But like, when you did this, six months later, the team members that spent the time doing that the new team members that were hired into these accommodated positions, like what other surprising, delightful, unexpected benefits that did you notice? You know, we talked about Dr. Chase, Chosewood's uh, statistics yesterday, right? About how your direct manager has a, and your team environment has a greater impact on your health and well-being than your medical doctor. We'll talk about building strong, inclusive environments. One of the engineers said, you know, I've known this guy for 25 years. He lives down the street from me. I've been working at Ford Motor Company for a decade, and now he comes to work and works right next to me in a place where he never, ever would have had the opportunity to do that type of work before. And the fact that the team went to all that effort to accommodate him, he's like, our team has never had better dynamics. The sense of well-being and inclusion is outstanding. And again, you get more productive teams, you have healthier relationships, and you'll presumably, with all we know about total worker health from our great talk yesterday, you'll have a longer, healthier working career. So in closing, I hope you've enjoyed this discussion on diversity, equity, and inclusion themes and ergonomics. I've highlighted how at Ford Motor Company, because of the scale and rate we build product, we really have to get up front and do all of our ergonomics engineering in the design process. And that proactive process, as we call it, since it was kicked off 25, 30 years ago, it's resulted in over 80% reduction in ergonomics issues that we catch when we move to physical builds for the first time. Changing a computer design is free outside engineering hours. Once you've cut a tool to make a part, you've got to get through that stock of parts and cut a new tool. That's really expensive. So it's amazing what the impact can be when you do it all up front. However, we recognize that our target population is diverse, and we reacted to that diversity by creating our own anthropometry distribution and building our own set of anthropometric digital human models that actually represent our target population. So as practitioners, the message is recognize the team you're designing for will be diverse, and just understand who you're designing for so you can optimize your ergonomics processes. The science of ergonomics means that equitable will, risk will not be equitable for everybody we're designing for. It's very simple and basic at face value. Of course, we design for weak people. It's a population approach. 
But at the end of the day, weaker people will always be working harder than stronger people. Shorter people and taller people will always be adopting different postures to perform the same work. As practitioners, we just need to be aware of that innate inequity and really see what we can do on the back end to mitigate that risk. And certainly there's lots of modern assembly line technologies we can leverage to achieve that goal. And there's lots of really exciting innovations and technologies that may help get us there in the future in even more incredible ways. But recognize that those innovations are on their own growth curve. And it doesn't mean that they're bad, and it doesn't mean that they're perfect. But as practitioners, especially in large enterprise, work with your vendors. Understand how these technologies can add benefit today and provide them with feedback so they can work hard to make them even better and help us even more in the future. They make great complements to an already existing healthy ergonomics program. Finally, we saw some incredible stuff done by, done by our teams in Mexico on creating inclusive workforces. I encourage you all to you know, work towards those lofty goals as well and create warm, healthy, inclusive workplaces where people feel a sense of belonging. It drives productivity and creates healthier, um, healthier working lives for everybody. So that's the end of my talk. I just want to say thank you to the Applied Ergonomics Committee for asking me to speak today. I want to say thank you to all my UAW Ford friends. You guys are 99th percentile amazing, always. And the sound guys, thank you for that as well. So I'm here until tomorrow. I hope that you take time to come say hello to me or any of the UAW Ford family who also attended. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your conference.